it is time uh, for the doctor. I've got Dr. Richard Scott. Hello, Richard. Hi, Andy. How are you doing? I'm, I'm not too bad. Uh, I look forward to these with great relish. I just love um, learning. I don't know lots about medicine, but I like absorbing lots of information about it, if that makes any sense. Well, it, it, it's, I have to say, it's a, it's a challenge for me too, because you, you stretch me beyond my normal boundaries, which is good. It's good for both of us. It's good to be challenged, though, isn't it? Because yeah. otherwise, life gets really mundane, and that's no good. True. Right, so this week we're going to work through some questions. I've got, let me just double check, one, two, three, four. I've got five questions from listeners for you. We'll take them and we'll see, we'll see how this goes. Uh, right, first question for Richard. I think this may well be a younger person. Uh, question for Dr. Richard Scott. If you enjoy, for instance, carrots, is it more beneficial than if you don't like eating carrots? Ah, oh, so <laughs> not necessarily related to last week. Um, if you enjoy, is it more beneficial? I, I can't see logically why it should be more beneficial. Um, that said, I'll go beyond carrots in a second. So the actual carrots will do the same job, whether you like them or not. <laughs> um, so, but here's the thing. If you do something that you don't like doing because you know it's good for you, that's actually a, a very good human trait. So, you know, sometimes, for example, as, as Christians, we might think, oh, can I be bothered to read the Bible? And then you go and read it. And actually, in those situations, in my experience, often you get more because God rewards you for your, for your perseverance. So I think the, the general idea of, of, you know, exercising, oh, I don't always feel like it, um, which we don't read in the Bible, whatever it is, whatever discipline. If you do something like that uh, in times when the body says no, uh, but, but, but you do it anyway. Um, that, so I think that it that that discipline is it's good for you. But the carrots, <laughs> that's if you like, that's a detail. The carrots will do you the same whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. I uh, I was actually asked by uh, Nathan from the from the breakfast show about cold water plunges because he's started having a shower mm -hmm. with a cold end. He said, well, "How long am I supposed to stand there again?" So he started <laughs> doing it, yes. and he wanted me to feedback to you because what he said was he was clearly quite nervous at the prospect of lovely warm water, cold water. I said, "Look, two minutes, about twelve minutes a, w a week is all you need." Yeah, one to two minutes. So he did that and he said, you know, I, I often feel better after a shower because it helps my muscles. But he said, and he's, he's verifying what you stated, he felt much better, quicker, for longer from his muscles from exercise, having had a hot shower with some cold at the end. Well, thank, good. Thank you, Nathan. You, you, uh, yeah, it's always good to have individual stories backing up the theory. Um, so that's good. Thank, well done. And keep it going. Yep. And then we had another one I needed to feedback for you, which is somebody who really, really wants to do this. They enjoy running, they walk their dogs. And they said, um, would it be OK if they waited until the summer when it was warmer <laughs> before they start doing cold water showers? Well, I think that's a point that you made, Andy, a week or two ago. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, indeed. Um, yeah. As long as these things don't get put off indefinitely. I mean, I think good intentions, by and large, it's good to do with good intention straight away otherwise they, they they can get forsaken but if you say to yourself right as soon as it's i don't know june the first um, or july the first um then then i'm going to do it then fine but, but hold yourself accountable okay right i got questions going back quite a while um mm. uh question for dr richard scott there has been a real push in my organization that i work for to raise awareness of the menopause provide support i'm all for informing people perhaps to bring reassurance allay fears help people cope but I am concerned about some of the ways this issue is being handled. There is a negative attitude. Some people are responding loudly. Personally, I prefer a quiet and gentle response. It's a personal, private thing. Having said that, I would like a Christian perspective on this subject. It seems to me to be a natural part of life that I know women, some women will suffer from. But could you please shed some light on the subject of menopause from a female over 50, but only just? Well, I could answer it from my wife's point of view. So my wife is the same age as me, 63, uh, obviously a woman, therefore she's gone through the menopause. Um, she's an evangelist for HRT. Uh, and the reason it, hormone replacement therapy, um, and the reason is that, that whilst it is a natural point of, uh, point of life for women, there's no doubt that when uh, hormones drop off as the uh, ovary stops secreting estrogen to the same extent, there, there are some awful, uh, physiological body symptoms in many many people um and you know once you start getting 
hot sweats, the, the change in uh, mentality. So people become depressed, uh, sometimes apathetic. Um, you can have dryness down below, so many symptoms, um, lack of energy, loss of libido, the whole works. It, it's, it's so drastic where such that people have thought, oh, could this be a full blown depression? Well, actually, no, it's the menopause treated very easily with HRT. You know, could it be other things? Well, no. First of all, think of the menopause. So um, I would say, based on what uh, she's a real expert with women's medicine, and particularly uh, hormonal aspects of women's medicine. Uh, so I'm going to give you her answer, which is that um, whilst it is a natural part of life, my goodness, this is something that we could help people with. Um, and there are people who seem to sail through without any trouble. That that's great, obviously, but so many people. Um, do have do have problems and then they're so grateful when they get treated and wonder why they waited so long so, so i would just say you know don't go looking for problems but if they find you um go and talk to your gp and most enlightened gps will will put people on hrt as long as there aren't contraindications notably your own breast cancer or very strong breast cancer in the family most, for most people it's it's uh, to be honest a bit of a no-brainer it's it's so worth giving it a go um, because otherwise you might say, well, what else should I not treat um, that, that we can help? Asthma, eczema, you know, cancer. Now you might say, well, these are diseases. Well, I would argue that the, the, the symptoms related to the menopause are also a form of disease, um, a dis-ease in the body, which is a disease, isn't it? And so, yeah, I think if you've got symptoms, go and see your GP and get treated. I like that dis-ease. Mm. That's a really good way of looking at it. Mm. It is. It is. Um, and, you know, you might say, well, it's, you know, there are other things that, that, that get worse as we get older. Well, there are, but some of them are highly amenable to treatment. High blood pressure, for example. You know, we wouldn't say that that, that was a dumb thing to treat. Well, I think with the menopause, you know, it's, the symptoms can be so rough, uh, really rough. And, it, and once we get it right, it's just life transforming. Is it as simple as, I mean, I don't, I know nothing about HRT apart from, I know it's hormones, I know it's a replacement, I know it's a therapy. But I mean, is it, is it injections? Is it a, a, a tablet? I mean, what yeah. are the different types of it? The, 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 so no, there's the same disease, but the, the treatments differ. And, um, you know, oral treatments, so tablets is, is a mainstay, but actually these days are gels, uh, which you rub onto the skin. Uh, my wife uses a gel, for example. Uh, other people have a, have a transdermal patch you can apply so there's different ways and, and, and uh you know if, if someone isn't suited by a patch they have a reaction they might have oral tablets whatever um but the, there are different ways of treating it but uh yeah it's it's not an injection it's, it's other 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 methods okay look uh right another question how much exercise do we need to complete on a regular basis in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle well i can tell you what's recommended which is approximately 30 to 40 minutes um three to four times a week so effectively alternate days but certainly every third day if you can't manage alternate days and, and i have to say i try to do that and when i'm not injured uh, i try to do that as well um so you know, a reasonable puffing and blowing so not just a walk um unless it's a really fast walk because we're too efficient at walking so it needs to be something where you're properly puffing and blowing biking exercise bike or proper cycling running swimming um, whatever but uh, yeah 30 to 40 minutes of, of really puffing and blowing raising your heart rate um to a you know, decent degree um 160 170 heart you know, beats a minute um three to four times a week and and that's what's recommended for a really good cardiac workout and generally helps us live longer um, does it matter if you break up the 30 minutes or does it need to be a block of 30 minutes um so when you say you mean stop at 30 minutes or well or, and can, then go on a bit longer can you do two lots of 15 minutes is that as, as good oh, as 30 uh, oh i would I, I would have thought so yes it's it's the total amount that you want that you, you need to do so that that would be fine uh, i wouldn't have a problem with that absolutely cool okay uh saw an article on the benefits of fasting for 24 hours in hmm. order to help some uh, sorry in order to help prevent some diseases i'm wondering what dr richard scott's thoughts are on that well, I reckon we should do that as a topic. So could I, could I, I mean, I've got some thoughts already, but I would like to do it better. Uh, so you've just given me another idea, which I'm grateful. I've got a, well, we've got a, a suggestion for next week, which is another hot topic. But fasting actually has been quite a topic. And I might say, uh, my, my wife to go back to Heather, um, it gives me a hard time because I don't fast. I have done a little in the past, but we, there are a lot of benefits, both spiritually and physically. So why don't we? Why don't I suggest we delay this one 
and um, and do it uh, another time. OK, I've got one more question for you. All right. Migraines and dark chocolate. What other foods can trigger it? And is there any way of getting around it? Mm. Well, plenty of foods can trigger it. Um, some people find shellfish, others strawberries, chocolate, uh, cheese, whole range of foods can trigger it. It's a bit like saying, oh, what foods give you allergies? Well, quite frankly, any food. What drugs give you allergies? Well, even paracetamol, aspirin, some people are allergic to. Um, so really, it can be triggered by many things. Yes, there are certain common things, chocolate, dark chocolate being one, cheese um, being, being another. But um, and I think people with migraine need to work out what it is, you know, write down when they have an attack or whatever I had recently, and then a pattern emerges. What can be done? Well, plenty can be done. There's all sorts of migraine medicines. There's both prevention, uh, prophylaxis, to use a flash word, and treatment. So again, this is something that GPs should be pretty well aware of. Um, so yes, absolutely avoid trigger factors. And by the way, there are other common trigger factors, stress is a common trigger factor. Getting dry, not drinking enough at work, getting dry, common trigger factor uh, for, for, my, for migraine. Um, so yeah, there's trigger factors, food, stress, et cetera, are getting dry, a few others, um, but, but there's plenty of treatments and there's some prevention as well. So again, no need to suffer, get help. Um, what would, how would you describe a migraine? Because to me, I, I know nothing. So I just think, well, it's like a really, really bad headache, but that's probably a terrible explanation. Yeah, well, the, you're, you're quite right. So often there's a, a, some people get an aura. They get a sense that something is about to happen. Uh, by no means all. Most people come in and say, oh, God, I've got this headache and describe that pain, particularly around the eye. Um, sometimes with zigzags in the vision, blurring and zigzags affecting your vision. So actually wow. seeing zigzag lines is, is a common, is a, is a common uh, cause. Usually people feel a bit sick. But the real classic thing is photophobia. So you get this awful, you know, when you look at a bright light, it just makes your eyesight, it just hurts in the eyes. So classically, people have to go lie down in a dark room without sound. So they can be sound phobic as well. So there we are. It's a sort of picture of, of light hurting you. Um, yeah, it's loud sounds hurting you much better often in just quietly in a dark room with a thumping headache. Um, and sometimes if you're really unlucky, you get... Uh, the pains or even weakness down one side of the body. So it's it's a nasty disease, often there's family history. Um, uh, but when people come with a classic history, we can say, yeah, this is migraine. You can often work out what the cause is uh, and um, yeah, get on and treat. Them. But it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a nasty old business, but for most people, quite well treatable. I didn't know it was treatable. Well, no, I assume there were some treatments. I didn't think it was quite as uh, able to be treated. That's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Um, what did I see the other day? Sticking your feet in water. Is, uh, is it hot water or something? Is that actually going to help? I missed that. Sticking what in water? I'm um, sticking your feet in water. I think oh, right. if you've got a migraine, someone says, oh, it's, it's like a, a miracle cure. I uh, don't know that one. Uh, no. I'll, okay. I'll see if the computer helps him on that. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> no, <laughs> unaware. <laughs> no. OK. Um, I was thinking as well. Um, the, the NHS in, in the UK, if not from the UK, the NHS is our health system, uh, of which Richard is a part as a family practitioner or a GP. Um, our NHS is struggling in, in many ways. How can we help people know, when mm. do I go to A&E, it's really urgent, as opposed to I can wait a week or so to go see my GP or maybe an out of hours thing. How, can we help people have some sort of sensible way of knowing themselves, which way do I need to go? Well, that's an enormous question because um, okay. it all depends on conditions. <laughs> but I, I, one, I think it's a very important one. In that, I think it should be teaching in schools. I, th I think you know yeah. people need to be taught these. These are the symptoms to watch out for. These minor coughs and colds you don't need to worry about. Um, I think there's all sorts of things. So I'll give you an, just a brief example. Child with a sore ear, earache, something we see very, very common in general practice. The the message from um, ENT surgeons is that. 90% of minor red ears, so it's slight earache or even quite bad earache, but day one, don't rush into the doctor because 90%, so nine out of 10, will get better themselves without antibiotics. Therefore, come in if it's persisting on the fourth day, for example. Um, so often we see people, oh, my child's got a sore ear day one. We say, well, actually 90% of these will not need antibiotics. Therefore, let's reduce your child's in, you know, needing to eat antibiotics for five days, plus reduce antibiotic resistance. So that sort of teaching would be really helpful in the community and, and preferably starting in schools. And same with coughs and colds, you know, don't come to a doctor. Now, more and more 
it's becoming more and more important because uh, a doctors are overstretched and b we've got more and more um sort of para doctors para physicians if you like say like not least pharmacists who are seeing people with minor conditions so i think the public need to be taught what can be go where they can go safely with minor conditions to a pharmacist um who then if they don't like what they see then they send the people to us but yeah there needs to be a huge amount of education a, a huge amount to uh yeah because i think one of the biggest issues we haven't tackled in the nhs is the government is always pouring more and more money in and more and more resources actually we need to reduce demand we need to tell the people you don't need to come in with this so don't come in with this <laughs> <laughs> because it's not necessary you're not going to get uh, any mm -hmm. any special treatment and by coming in you're stopping more important people coming in so I think education is a, is a massive issue that, that needs to be tackled. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Schools are a really good place. Um, dental, I, I remember having the, some dentist teacher type person coming in, talking about cleaning your teeth, and I was quite shocked. And it was really interesting. And I've always remembered some of that stuff because they were enigmatic, they were passionate. And that, that retains in your head because it was interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. And we need that in schools. Yes, I completely agree. Right. Uh, that was one, two, three, four. That's about five questions and two feedbacks that I've been saving up for you since uh, mid-end of December. <laughs> very good. good very good. Um, can you let us know what next week's topic is if you're you seem yes. excited? So another hot topic. And this this came out of um, the, the, the Times newspaper um, a couple of weeks ago. And I'll, I'll, I'll read you the headline. Would you take an Alzheimer's test? I did. And it's unnerving. If you want to know, here's the subtext, if you want to know whether dementia is your fate, this lady has the lowdown on the new blood test. So big one. Obviously, people, Ooh. there's an awful lot of treatment uh, work going on in dementia. Denazepil, Aricept is a drug that we've used for years, seems to slow down dementia a bit by, say, six months. But this is a big one. Would you want to know? You know, there's a test that's available. Not yet, but it's coming. Um, that's going to be available. Would you want to know in advance that in, say, 10, 15, 20 years time, you're going to get dementia or not? And um, so I'm going to throw that one open for discussion. It's an ethical question. Mm. It's a practical question. Um, and uh, yeah, there we are, something that you and I might uh, chew the cut over, Andy, and hopefully your listeners as well. So I'm going to look at what is this blood test? You know, is it accurate? When's it likely to come in? Um, and yeah, what are the pros and the cons of knowing that down the line there's a big problem coming i have many thoughts already so i'm not going to go anywhere um <clears throat> save it for next week <laughs> oh, definitely no i've got loads of thoughts about the future um sort of uh, self-fulfilling prophecies and all that stuff so we'll we'll come on to that when you've uh, you've explored this for us and now we've got another one for after that fasting fasting yes so there we go. We've got two 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 topics. Uh, both they're always hot topics. These things because they're in the news, which is why it grabs people's attention. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Uh, and you said you thought this might be a quick week. It's not. <laughs> uh, thank you, Richard. If you've got any questions that you've seen in the news, any hot topics that you're seeing, uh, then you can email us here, and I'll put them to Richard. The email is hello at pure two four seven radio dot org. Hello at pure247radio.org. Dr. Richard Scott, GP, is a GP or founding practitioner, if you're from outside the UK, and you can send your questions to him through me. Thank you, Richard. Andy, always good. And uh, yeah, fun as usual. Absolutely. Thank you kindly. Have a good time. Bye. Cheers.